everything is lined up here for silver to continue its steady move back towards the uh, 50 level over the next well you can see the time at the bottom of the chart there october 2025 so over the next just over 12 months or so uh, it, it doesn't need to take 12 months to break out it could just at any point between now and um, next year it could you know suddenly develop one of these candles that just shoots off out of the top of the uh, top of the handle um, so we're in an environment where silver is more likely to be volatile to the upside than the downside Welcome back to Capital Cosm, everybody. Today, we've got Kevin Wadsworth from North Star Bad Charts back on the show. Kevin, thank you so much for coming on, my friend. Hey, Danny, it's great to uh, great to speak to you again. How are you doing? Pretty good. Can't complain. Uh, I had a really, really good weekend. I know you were out vacationing out in the uh, southern coast of Spain, right? I was. I was. And uh, I turned my back for a few days and uh, everything starts to crumble and fall apart. So, uh, yeah, I spent the weekend just uh, catching up with some of the... Uh, some of the charts, yeah. Yeah, we can't have you going out on vacation anymore, Kevin. We've got <laughs> just for the sake of the eye eye world. On, keep my eye on things. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. My, my bad. Sorry about that. <laughs> <laughs> well, hey, Kevin. I, I um I know you've been on the show before. Typically on our four chartsman episodes, where we get like you and and Patrick and Andy from Finding Valley Finance kind of talk about the charts. But I think this is the first one we've had one on one. So I'd like for you to introduce yourself to the audience who may not know who you are. Who is Kevin? Um, what is your kind of like uh, journey into this space? Yeah, sure. Well, my, my background is as a, um, an aviation uh, meteorologist, mostly military, <coughs> excuse me, military aviation. So I spent 34 years um, analyzing the atmosphere, really, for the benefit of the Royal Air Force, primarily, but also uh, broadcasting organizations and that kind of thing. But it's my time spent in aviation that kind of um, got me to realize that there are parallels be between the way meteorology is uh, carried out and the way technical chart analysis is carried out in both cases in my view anyway the, it's all about um, assessing probabilities it's about assessing the evidence so yeah i spent um uh, as i said 34 years doing, doing the weather forecasting and uh, aviation but uh, it's kind of on the side of that i was um had this weird hobby of trying to apply that to technical charts and kind of built up my own uh, techniques and uh, I suppose it reached a point where I thought, uh, "Come on, you know, I can, I can do this for a living. I can, uh, I can jack in the day job, forget about that, and, and start doing this more seriously." I had my own investments to to um, to monitor, and I was using these techniques on my own investments. So that's kind of how I, I fell into it. I was uh, posting my charts on um, a gold and silver forum type uh, website, and then moved my analysis to Twitter, uh, as it used to be called, of course, X now. Um, and it seemed to take off. People liked it, I think. I, I, I tend to try and use graphics that are as easy to interpret and understand as possible. I don't like to think that people are looking at my charts and, and can go away with the wrong impression or a misunderstanding. So I, I try and bring across some of my techniques from briefing aircrew and briefing pilots um, in, in, a, in a way that um, kind of brings the chart to life. And people seem to like that. So I've got quite a big following. And uh, set up the website that you mentioned northstarbadcharts.com with uh, with my friend and colleague Patrick Karim. Yeah, I've actually looked through the website. I'm actually quite impressed. I mean, you, <laughs> you try to strip out the, the the narrative side of investing as much as possible, which is you try to keep it objective and and, and more importantly repeatable, right? So, um definitely recommend people check out North Star Bad Charts. We have a link to that down below. Um Let's go ahead and dive into broad strokes in the economy. So start macro, and then we can kind of hone in on specific sectors. Uh, broadly speaking, what are you seeing out there by way of the markets? Yeah, sure. So I've been saying for a number of years now, actually, that 2024 and this particular election cycle, uh, time the timing side of it in terms of cyclical behavior of the charts and a lot of the signals and signs that the charts are giving when i say the charts i'm talking about commodities precious metals stock markets in particular um that they're pointing to an inflection point um late this year which might not be surprising i suppose because that of course is the us election um time but resolution of some pretty long term patterns appears to be likely towards the end of this year um so I think, you know, if, for anybody that's been invested in precious metals and particularly precious metals miners, it's been very frustrating for a very long period of time. 
gold has actually moved up around about eight hundred dollars um, over recent months from the sixteen hundred lows to twenty four hundred or so. So gold has done very well, but the mining um, shares, many of them haven't done so well. And of course, uranium is struggling somewhat as well after its uh, initial big surge uh, a few years ago. Uh, so it kind of feels like a lot of the markets are treading water. We've seen tech moving strongly. We've seen NASDAQ and the S&P in very clearly defined bull markets, and that remains the case. So whilst I got my eye on what may be coming at the end of this year uh, with some concerns, um, I've got no reason to turn bearish yet on stock markets until the technical analysis evidence gives us a reason to be bearish on stock markets and um, particularly the larger tech companies like NVIDIA, for example, then we just have to um, keep on playing the long term bull market that's been in place for, for quite a period of time now. There are a number of key charts that I'll, I'll share with, with, you, with the viewers shortly that will tell us without any bias, without any narrative needed, uh, completely you know, bias free, uh, scientifically telling us when this inflection point has been crossed. And that's going to be key to everybody watching this. If you're wanting to be on the right side of macro trends over the next, let's say, three to five years, it's critical that you spot these inflection points. And it's critical that you weight your portfolios according to what they're telling you. Yeah, 100%. Uh, let's just keep digging into the economy for a second. Now, uh, one of the telltale signs of a recession is a uh, is the inversion of the 10-2 spread, right? The 10-year versus two-year. Yeah. Um, yeah. We are currently in the longest reigning inversion you know, uh, bound uh, that we, or time, time frame that we've ever been in. Um, what does that portend to? What's your take on that? Yeah, I can share that chart now if you want me to. I've got that sure. on my screen. Um, I'll, I'll just quickly share my screen. Just give me a moment. Um, yeah, you're right to say that, Danny. The, the 10... Uh, the 10 minus the 2 has been inverted for um, what seems like a very long time at the moment. And I've been tracking that chart. And I think anybody following me on social media or our website members will know that I check in with this chart regularly. I'll just uh, switch my screen sharing on so everyone can see this. Um, OK, so this is the 10 minus the 2 year yield chart, as you said. And I've imported a risk matrix from the world of meteorology into this chart. I'll explain that in a moment. But the, this chart shows uh, the 10 minus the two-year yield. Now, normally, the 10 minus the two is a positive number. The 10-year yield is normally greater than the two-year yield. So when you do 10, the 10-year 10 yield minus the two-year yield, it gives you a positive number. But there are periods in history when it gives a negative number, and that's when it's below this, this red line on, mm -hmm. the, on the zero level. And that's, as you said, called an inversion. The yield curve is inverted. So when you subtract the two-year yield from the 10-year yield, you're getting a negative number, and that is less less common. I mean, if you think about it for a, a moment, it makes sense that normally the 10-year yield would be greater than the two-year yield because you'd expect to pay greater, greater rates of interest to um, to hold uh, to to hold the the, um, the bond for a longer period of time, um, greater risk, of course. But when that yield curve becomes inverted, strange things happen, um, and you can see that each time the yield curve becomes inverted and then uninverts and interacts with that zero line something um very significant crops up at the time that it's happening you don't really know what it is or what it's called or these names that i put on here they that these labels come sort of later on in the early 90s recession the asian crisis the dot com mm -hmm. bust great financial uh, crisis or crash the subprime uh, repo liquidity crisis covid these labels are sort of attached a, a little bit later during or after the event so what we can see at the moment is that we've <laughs> i've also labeled on here just how long these um, periods have been that we've been underneath that red line this is a monthly chart you'll notice in the top left so where it says 10 bars that's 10 months 11 bars 11 months 16 right. months and so on so at the moment 23 in fact i need to update this don't i anyway let's extend it along now two years we've been uh, inverted okay two years um, and it's so also the steepest it's also the deepest inversion deepest right? yeah. um on this time frame I th I, somebody may correct me with um data that goes back further but i think if you go back into the 70s and perhaps even to sort of world war ii looking at fed fund rates and that kind of stuff you may find something that is comparable um but don't quote me on that but certainly going back 
40, 40 years or so, this is the deepest and most significant longest inversion. So what my um, suggestion is that I said on here, plausible deniability and distraction is coming. What I mean by that is that when this thing uninverts, that, you know, there'll be all sorts of reasons given, you know, it could be something in, within the economy. It may be something that, you know, the politicians have done. It may be a war. It may be a, a pandemic. It could, any excuse could come along. Any narrative could come along. But what I'm saying to you, ignore the narrative. I don't, you know, I don't care what the what label it's given, particularly, you know, not not as far as this chart is concerned. I mean, it's going to be significant when it comes to, you know, uh, obviously if it's a banking crisis, then it'll be very significant for that sector. Or you know, so there are there are reasons to to care exactly what it is, housing crisis or whatever. But in terms of this chart and the fact that there's there's an issue, I, you know, it it doesn't matter what's causing it. And you know, it's just the fact that we've got to have a major major event. You know, in the in the future, at some point, don't ask me how long it's going to to take to play out. But this is perhaps a bull flag that's forming here. I'm I'm just surmising that at the moment. It's the type of chart pattern that is perhaps um, sort of morphing into existence at the moment. A bull flag, which if it uh, resolves as these things would normally do, then you would get something like like that. And right. that would take it back above the zero line. That would take it, you know, to maybe somewhere approaching half a percent. Were that to happen, um, then you would expect some. I'm not an economist, so Danny, please don't ask me why. Please don't ask me to go into the economics of this. I'm a, I'm a meteorologist. I'm a scientist. I'm applying technical analysis. I'm, I'm definitely not an economist, so I'm not going to go into that too deeply. But what I can say from the analysis is that some type of event is is highly likely. There are no certainties. In technical chart analysis, by the way. So if you hear me say anything in terms of certainties, then um, you know, um, send me a, um, a an email or a message having a having a go at me because I, I shouldn't be using terms of um, you know in terms of one hundred percent. But what we can do is assess probabilities, and clearly, you know, from the evidence, the probability is that some kind of event is coming. This this risk matrix is um, to assess. Uh, the um the level of risk and it's a combination of likelihood of the event and the impact were the event to occur it's used widely in um, risk analysis and certainly used in the world of meteorology globally uh, the uk met office developed this for um for, for global weather forecasting um, and i think other global forecasting agencies have taken up something similar uh, so what i'm saying is we're going to have a high impact event okay so that automatically puts us in the right hand column it's a high impact event. The impact levels are marked along the bottom here. So it's a high impact event that's coming our way. Now, the likelihood of that event is currently low. Why is it low? Well, it's low because we're quite a distance below that zero line. And month after month, week after week, month after month, we are remaining some distance below that zero line. If we were to break out from this wedge and start to advance towards the zero line, then I would update this matrix and move the check mark and say that we now have a medium likelihood of a high impact event occurring in the next one to three months. Okay, that's the that's the sort of time frame I'm looking at. The next sort of one to three months, not sort of one to three years. So it's it's weeks to months, um, that, that kind of time frame. Um, and once we do start to interact with that red line itself, then I would put us on a high likelihood of a high impact event. High likelihood, you know, notice the language. It's not certain. There's nothing definite. It's a high likelihood. And something, the reason we use these impact matrices is so that people can prepare. And it allows investors and traders to prepare in whatever in whatever way they want to. Now, you know, I'm not a financial advisor, so I'm not going to tell people what they, they should definitely do. I know what I'll probably do. I'll just, you know, sit on the, on the margins with in cash because you know, when these type of events come along, everything can sell off and the baby gets thrown out with the bathwater, by which I mean gold, for example, can can drop 30 percent, you know, at the same time as the stock market's dropping 50, 60 or 70 percent, as has as happened in the past. So what happened during COVID. Yeah, that's exactly it. And people need to realize and remember, of course, that precious metals are recovering. You know, so they're recovery metals. They perform best when the stock market is actually rising. You need, well, I don't want to sort of jump the gun here, probably going on to other charts, but you need the stock markets to um, have suffered a severe event 
and be in the recovery phase for precious metals to to really shine. And precious metals massively outperform the stock market during the recovery until the stock market reaches its, reaches its previous highs again. And then that spells the end of the precious metals bull market. So just during that initial sort of, call it what you want, collapse phase or calamity phase, um, it may well be safer just to sit on the sidelines and let the, the dust settle. Um, but these sort of ratio charts that we use will will give us the evidence that we need to um, to make those decisions, Danny. Yeah, it seems from what I'm seeing is like it's that we're in uncharted territory, right? No pun intended. Um, <laughs> but where does this kind of put the gold price at? What 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 is gold? Uh, what are some broad strokes that you're seeing in terms of gold? And um, you know how how does gold typically behave in this kind of um, you know environment? Okay, I'll move on to the gold chart and uh, answer that question as succinctly as I can. Um, so I've had a gold roadmap um, which. I issued on, um, on on social media back in 2019, and that gold map focused on this arc pattern. If you look at this black uh, geometric arc, and it's just a support line. All these lines on the chart, they're just support and resistance lines, okay? Um, all these lines that I've put on the chart, the red lines and this this black arc, uh, our chart, our... our, our um, support and resistance lines. So when you see me put an arc on the chart like that, it doesn't mean that the price can't break below it. Um, you know, I've, I've done the same with the Bitcoin chart, for example. It doesn't mean that price can't cross below these support and resistance lines. It just tells you that they're going to offer support and resistance. And it's important to note what happens when price interacts with that line. Anyway, it's a cup and handle pattern. Cup there that completed sometime in 2020, 2021. Um, we peaked at uh, wherever it was somewhere close to $2,000 uh, and then formed this sort of consolidation handle pattern, which we broke out of very clearly uh, at the back end of last year, sort of November, December time. And then we hovered above the breakout line for a while before the more recent um, upside move. Now, if we just zoom out a little bit, you can see a number of other lines on the chart or a number of other things on the chart that are objective the lines I put on are subjective. Uh, you know, I can put them wherever I want. You know, you can argue with me and say I've put them in the wrong place. But the green line there and the the red line, this this um this green line here and this red line, right. they're they're the they're the moving averages. So we've got the uh, three year and twelve month moving average on there. And if you focus on the the green line, the three year moving average, it tends to support price very well during the bull market, and then. It caps the price during the bear market, and then you get the, the sort of consolidation period where it's above and below, and then it's broken out. It sort of tested that three-year moving average, and it actually found support on my uh, rising red 24-year support line and the green splodge on the chart there, which is uh, something called the Ichimoku cloud. It's a Japanese uh, technical indicator that projects support and resistance into the into the future. So. Uh, Using a number of techniques, and you can see the Fibonacci set up here as well, um, a number of techniques gave me targets that were anywhere between 2535, 2660, and I've got 2690 there. So we've got an area of resistance, and we got very close to that with the recent highs of 2488, whether that is just about close enough to, to call it a touch on my 2535 the trouble is, Danny, when you're drawing lines like this on charts that go about 40 years, just a tiny little adjustment on the line, and you're sort of, oh, okay, so I did hit the yeah. line. So small, you, changes, you have to... small changes in the input create big changes in the output. I see. It's, you, it's, know it's that, very... you know that as a meteorologist. It, exactly, exactly. I mean, it's very easy with hindsight, you know, as in meteorology, you know, you're trying to forecast a thunderstorm moving across your region, and, um, you know, you get one slight calculation out, and instead of the thunderstorm you know, hitting one town, it hits another town, even though you were correct to forecast the thunderstorm and it formed and it happened um, for the people on the ground who are experiencing the weather, you know, an error of a, a few miles makes a big difference. Same thing here, which is why you always have to be um, realistic and sensible when you're assessing these charts. You, you can't just draw a pencil thin line on the chart and expect the price to, you know, to react beautifully, perfectly, and, you know, completely in line with where you've drawn that line. It just doesn't work as as well as that. So it's always about probabilities. The, the place that we're at now, Danny, is we are 
um, approaching that resistance area. Now, whether we move up to 26, 2700, that region or not, that was my initial expectation. And I think it probably still is, so long as gold doesn't break down strongly from this recent little um, sort of consolidation period here. Now, how we end this month might give us a clue, because if we have a huge wick on that candle, and after being up at, what did I say, 20, 2488, if we were to finish the month somewhere down near, um, well, I don't know, 2350 or something like that, then it would start to look like a, a pretty bearish candle, wouldn't it? So that would then increase the probability not the certainty, but the probability that we come down to test this region just above $2,000. So I think at some point, whether it's now or whether it's later, we're going to have a much bigger correction. Um, you know, we're just bobbling around here between 24, 25, 2600. But at some point, we're going to have a bigger correction. If I just focus your attention on the bottom part of the chart here, this is mm -hmm. the distance from moving average. And if you're wanting to, as a technical chartist, work out when... Uh, or, or where gold might go in a strong move. Look at the distance from moving average. This is the distance from three-year moving average, and don't be too greedy about where you put the line. You could, you could, okay, you can say that gold might get nearly two hundred percent above the moving average because it did do back in nineteen seventy-nine, but that's greedy. Expecting that to happen anytime soon. More reasonable is a target somewhere perhaps around forty percent above the three-year moving average. Ignore the peaks because they're blow-off tops. Just, just you know, it, it's nice if you get a blow-off top. It's nice if you get a, a peak like that, but don't count on it. So mm -hmm. I'm so, what I'm saying here is that 40% is a reasonable target for the distance from moving average. So if we measure 40% from the three-year moving average, and I'll just squish that back down there, we measure 40% above where the three-year moving average is going to be in you know a, a month or two's time. That's what this, this um, calculation is on here. That's 40% above the three-year moving average. So three-year moving average has now probably moved up a little bit, so at 1943 at the moment, but it doesn't massively change the target area. The target area would still be somewhere around 2,700. So that is and remains a plausible target. And the distance from moving average, you can treat it like a, a price chart, by the way. So breakouts and breakdowns apply on this distance from moving average. So you can draw a support line for your distance from moving average and unless it breaks down, you're still in that trend. Um, you can probably see one or two examples of that. I don't know, maybe maybe there, for example, you see the distance from moving average, moving up, moving up. And then here it broke down and back tested that support line. And if we look at the chart above and see what was going on at that point in time, I'll just uh, put a horizontal line on for you. So it's somewhere around about, around about there. And we'll just zoom in on that chart what was going on around about there well there you go you see around that that time we peaked and then we dropped we actually dropped from two thousand dollars all the way down to 16 1600 or so and you can see if you look at the distance from moving average at the bottom what was going on at that point we'd broken down and we back tested and it seems like you hit a double top there right yeah That's yeah the... so what i'm what i'm sort of saying is that you can you can use these indicators and distance from moving average is a very good one because it helps you estimate targets. You can also use them to tell you when you probably ought to be exiting as well, because on all time frames, whether it's a monthly chart like this one or a weekly chart or a daily chart, when the distance from moving average breaks down, then you get your it actually does quite well, Danny, on as a sort of a leading indicator. A lot of indicators mm -hmm. don't give you much pre-warning. But this one, if you look carefully, and if I put the line on where it broke down, it actually broke down and then back tested. And on that back test, if you had exited on the back test, you would have avoided a $400 drop. Now, it depends whether you're a short-term trader or a long-term trader or a stacker, of course, because if you're stacking gold for the longer term, then you don't care about that. You know that gold's going to go up because gold um, tracks loss of purchasing power. So over time, gold is going to go up, just like um, the price of a, a car goes up or the price of a house goes up. A, a bar of gold is exactly the same as that. Um, you know, If you want to buy a house in gold coins, it's going to cost you the same now as it did in 1975 because both houses and gold have tracked each other. And they've tracked each other because the the piece of paper that you're buying your houses and your gold with is uh, is getting destroyed by by your government 
So don't think of paper, the paper as currency. Think of something more solid as currency, whether it's gold or silver or houses. That's your currency. That's your solid currency, your reliable currency. If you want to call the dollar your currency, well, fine. But <clears throat> just bear in mind that you're not going to get very much with it in a few years' time. Interesting. Uh, what about silver? Silver, uh, the little sister of gold. What, what do you see? Yep. So silver... silver uh, I've got a chart here that I put out um, just a, a day or two ago, and silver has a, a cup and handle pattern as well. It's been going for 45 years now, and you, <laughs> you get these chart patterns on all time frames. By the way, I quite often say hear people saying, "Oh, you can't have a cup and handle that's lasted 45 years." You know, some chart expert 50 years ago said that you can't have a cup and handle that lasts more than I don't know six months or 12 months or whatever. Garbage, absolute garbage. These fractals occur on all time frames. So if you look at the, mm -hmm. the minute chart, the hourly chart, the four hourly chart, whatever, they all have these technical chart patterns and they all play out exactly the same way. They play out the same way. There's no difference. So here's a here's a here's probably the biggest cup and handle pattern you're likely to see. All it means is that the targets are much higher and the significance of breaking out is, is much greater. If you break out on a cup and handle on an hourly chart, you might see the price go up 10 cents as a result. If you break out of a cup and handle pattern that's been going for 45 years, then you better stand back and, and watch in awe, I guess. So also on here, you can see that as the um, MACD indicator breaks out above the zero line and you have this blue uh, and orange line on the MACD indicator, when the blue line's above the orange one <clears throat> and you're above zero, look at what happens to the silver price. Here it moved from... Um, five dollars ten all the way up to well nearly fifty dollars back in the 1970s when the macd indicator did the same thing you moved from just over two dollars again up to almost fifty dollars so you can begin to imagine what might happen now the macd indicator is above the zero line the blue is above the orange uh, we're in what i'm saying is we're in an environment now where silver should in all probability continue strongly to the upside so all chart patterns, no matter how bearish they might look, should resolve to the upside. That's what is uh, the probabilities are testing us. And as an example, this was a, a a chart pattern that got everybody very frustrated, and people saying that silver was going back to, I don't know, ten dollars or something. But because we had this cup and handle pattern, and we had the MACD indicator above the zero line, it was always much much more likely to resolve to the upside than to break down and resolve to the downside. So um, everything is lined up here for silver to continue its steady move back towards the uh, 50 level over the next, well, you can see the time at the bottom of the chart there, October 2025. So over the next just over 12 months or so, uh, it, it doesn't need to take 12 months to break out. It could just at any point between now and um, next year, it could, you know, suddenly develop one of these candles that just shoots off out of the top of the uh, top of the handle. Um, so we're in an environment where silver is more likely to be volatile to the upside than the downside. Uh, should silver outperform gold in this environment? Yeah, so that's that comes back to the gold silver ratio chart, uh, which um, you'll be pleased to hear I've got here somewhere. Uh, let me just find it for you. There we go. Uh, so the gold-silver ratio um, is, to answer your question, Danny, yes, it should. It, it should. So silver should outperform gold uh, during the course of the next um, probably couple of years or so. There will be a point where the outperformance of silver over gold um, sort of grinds to a bit of a halt, I think, and, and they both sort of perform equally. Uh, but there are times to hold silver and there are times to hold gold, clearly. And you can make quite big gains in your um, portfolio of precious metals by knowing when to hold one over the other. This is one of the services we, we sort of provide on, on the website. And we we track um, the points in time when these breakdowns occur. And so you can see the chart has broken down below my key support line, showing that silver is in a period of outperformance versus gold. It's wanting to retest that breakdown which is perfectly normal and in fact uh, i think at the moment we're sort of fairly flat on both gold and silver if you actually look back on the chart here all the way back to 2022 
really it's, it's gone up it's gone down it's gone up it's gone down but overall it's just gone sideways but the point to note is that once we're below this key support line you're susceptible to a much larger downside drop and i think my my thoughts were that the targets or the target for that ratio during the next move could very well be somewhere around um around the 67 to 1 uh, area for the for the ratio you can see the um support and resistance that that level has given over the last um, 10 years or so. So it's a region of support and resistance. And I'm not saying exactly 67, but it might be 69, it might be you know 65, but that sort of area. And then by, by doing a little bit of mathematics on that ratio, you can work out um, a range of silver prices and gold prices. So if my target of sort of 2,700 is reached on that gold chart that I was showing you earlier on, if, if that is indeed where we're heading, then silver should be headed to the 40 area. Being such a spiky metal, silver may very well overshoot on a smaller time frame. And for a few days or, or a week or so, you may actually see silver spiking up to 45 or 50. Um, entirely possible. As I say, silver is a very volatile metal. And one, once sort of capital starts to flow into the sector, it can uh, react very strongly. And the reason that precious metals are in this sort of limbo at the moment, there's a number of reasons. And, and charts like this, uh, give you a clue. This is gold versus inflation, and gold versus inflation uh, CPI um, is right on the verge of a major breakout here. Um, using the month, this is a month, uh, sorry, quarterly chart. So on a quarterly basis, um, if we were to close uh, September above this spot where this arrow is pointing, then that would count as a breakout, um, and that would be a very strong piece of evidence for gold entering a new prolonged um bull market and you can see again the macd indicator on the bottom is in a bullish configuration so at the moment the probabilities favor gold breaking out versus cpi in terms of capital flows uh, the capital to power the precious metals bull market is going to come from from stock markets you do not have a precious metals bull market without outperforming um, the stock markets so this is uh, the dow to gold ratio with a, a few notes on it, uh, it's Dow to gold. So it means when the chart goes up, Dow is outperforming. And when the chart drops, gold is outperforming. And when I say outperforming, gold can outperform uh, the Dow by hundreds of percent on the way down, prob probably even thousands of percent. Let me just measure it for you for a moment. Um, let's track that one there. Uh, so in fact, I'll do it the other way up. So what we're talking about, if yeah, six, you probably can't see the number on there, but it's about 600% going upwards like that. Uh, it's a drop of about 80% of um, on the chart for Dow versus gold. So what's going on here is capital is sloshing around. It's, 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 mm -hmm. it's moving around in waves between the stock market and gold, the stock market, gold, stock market, gold. And to have that precious metals bull era i don't mean a, i don't mean a bull market gold is clearly in a bull market at the moment but to have a precious metals bull era that is going to be comparable to the 1970s the 1930s or or the 2000 early 2000s then this has to break down and it is trying to break down at the moment it's very close to giving a, a fairly clear breakdown signal and again there's a little bit of you know where do you put the line you could argue in fact let me pop it on the line chart. You could very well argue that it's already broken down. So if you use if you use the quarterly closes on the line chart, then it looks as though it's broken down. You could be a little bit more cautious and draw it on the wicks on the candles and and wait for a, a much clearer, much more obvious breakdown. But <clears throat> either way, to me, and again with the way the MACD is trending there, it looks as though this is in a bearish phase which is good for gold, because if it's in a bearish phase, it means gold is going to outperform the Dow. And more importantly than that chart is the gold to S&P ratio. And I think Patrick's probably shown you this one before. It, it's kind of what has kept us from giving our full um, sort of uh, stamp of approval to the gold bull market, uh, because gold has not broken out clearly versus the S&P at the moment. You can see that Back in the 1930s, 
big strong breakout, buy gold, sell gold. That was the signal from the chart. In 1969, um, the year I was born, actually, <laughs> um, the, uh, the chart broke out and it was a buy gold signal. You got a breakout, it then broke above the 0 0.5 resistance level. That's where gold is worth 50% of the S&P. And as the chart rises, gold massively outperforms the S&P by hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of percent. Gold doubled and then it doubled again, then it doubled again, then it doubled again, then it doubled again. So if it was to do the same again today, and the same thing happened here. I mean, gold was down at, um, what was it down here? Two, $200, $250, something like that. It doubled and then it doubled again, then it doubled again. So, you know, if it was to do that now and doubled, it would be, <laughs> you know, you do, you do the maths on that, you know, 2,400 becomes 4,800, double it again, 4,800 double becomes nearly 10,000, double it again, becomes nearly 20,000. So, you know, if history repeats, some very, very high numbers are plausible for gold. And it doesn't mean the world is going to fall apart because it's happened before. You know, this is, this is you know, currency destruction. It's loss of purchasing power. Um, it takes place over the course of maybe 10 years. Uh, but it's nothing that hasn't happened uh, on multiple previous occasions, but it hasn't broken out yet. So until it breaks out above the 0 0.5 level, then it's a little bit, to coin one of Patrick's phrases, it's a bit sketchy. Um, any upside moves are still a little bit, um, you know, vulnerable to um, sizable right. downside corrections. It's not until you get above that 0 0.5 level. The importance of this, Danny, is that, there's a huge, I don't know how many trillions are tied up in, this, in, the, in the stock markets, but if you look at NVIDIA on its own, what is it now, three trillion? Yeah, yeah. <laughs> you know? I mean, if you if you strip out the MAG3, NVIDIA, Microsoft, and I think Alphabet, I mean, the stock market's actually been flat, if not down. Well, and that's another sort of, um, you know, if, you, if you're wanting to look beneath the surface, you know, okay, a, a duck floating in water looks very graceful, but you look beneath the surface, there's all sorts of stuff going on with the webbed feet to keep the thing floating. <laughs> and it's, mm -hmm. Stock market's a bit like that at the moment. You're looking at these sort of um, headline grabbing um, numbers of the S&P and NASDAQ and NVIDIA and so on. But there's a lot of stuff in there that ain't doing so well. Uh, and that affects charts like this, of course. The S&P, um, the gold isn't going to break out versus the S&P until those uh, big, big stocks that are holding the, the market up break down. And that probably explains why gold has actually done okay, because some some capital will be rotating and has been clearly rotating into precious metals, but it's going to get one hell of a boost when NASDAQ, S&P break down. I say when, if and when NASDAQ and S&P make much clearer breakdowns. Yeah, so if you look at that uh, level there in 2020, so we did break above that 0 0.5 line, right? Right there, yeah. And uh, so, like, if we transport ourselves back to that time, would that been would that have been a call for um for a gold bull era? In that case, uh, no, because the rest of the evidence wasn't in place, Danny. So there's a lot of other evidence around um, other ratio charts that need to fall into place. So you can't you, you can't just have one piece of the jigsaw puzzle that tells you that this is a gold bull era. You need all of the pieces of the puzzle. And in previous years, other pieces were missing. But right now, this is just about the last piece of the puzzle that hasn't quite yet fallen into place yet. If you look at gold versus M2, gold versus, well, gold versus CPI, I showed you that chart. It's right on the verge of breaking out. Uh, gold versus M2, uh, well, that chart broke uh, quite a long time ago. Um, uh, there, there are a number of, as I say, ratio charts that we track that give us these clues. And they're pretty much all lined up now with just one or two last sort of little pieces to fall into place. But until they are all in place, you can't give that highly confident um, view that we're now in a sustainable multi-year bull trend that's going to take gold north of $5,000. That that remains unrealistic until this chart breaks out. I mean, gold could crawl its way to $3,000, $3,500. But if you're looking for five. Seven, eight, ten thousand dollars that comes after this chart breaks out. Okay, right. So, Kevin, what I've been doing over the course of the last, uh, you know, several episodes, a few weeks now, is I've been asking my guest to ask a question to the next guest. So, if there's a question you'd like to ask my next guest, what would it be? <laughs> okay. Um, how about this? Uh, what 
do you think the price of Bitcoin is going to be on election day? Mm, interesting. I'll give you a little hint on my next guest is just if you want to change your question. It's Art Berman. Okay, so how about what is your ultimate target for the gold price? Uh, and when do you think it will achieve that? Gotcha. Uh, so I mentioned Bitcoin because, of course, there are many people out there who believe Bitcoin is taking the crown from gold and is going to be the, the go-to safe haven asset. So it's always interesting to to get people's view on that. I, I'm completely agnostic on that. I, uh, I um, don't have a particularly strong view. Bitcoin may have the ability to take on a role similar to gold. I know that a lot of people like Bitcoin for similar reasons to why people like gold. Um, it's um, a way out of uh, the US dollar and it's a way out of, um, you know, the trap that we find ourselves in. So, uh, you know, I, it, it, for me, it's a question of sound money and whether Bitcoin is and can sustain itself as sound money is always interesting. But yeah, also, you know, very interesting to know what people's ultimate targets are for precious metals and when they see the bull market ending. I think, um, I think it was Michael Oliver from uh, M MSA I think he had a slightly different view to us. He's very bullish on gold, but uh, expects the bull market to end rather more rapidly than we do. So he's got some very high targets. Mm. But I, I, I think he was thinking about those targets coming much, much quicker than, uh, than than we are. I think he might have had similar price targets, but in a much shorter time frame. Um, but it's yeah, it's always interesting to get people's views on that. I mean, I've got my own views, and you know, they are, you know, that the late 2020s will see gold north of five thousand dollars and quite possibly somewhere near that ten thousand range um but yeah see what uh, see what he has to say yeah okay i'm interviewing him uh right after you so we'll see what he <laughs> said my question for you however is from uh from uselink aka casper i think oh, you yeah, know. one of his tweets today is a is a good guy yeah so he wants to know i think with today's event i think i would love to hear his take on uranium on a broad picture, where are we? Because it's very, we've been in a, in a big choppy market for the, basically for the entire 2024. So I would love to get his view. Are we finally about to break that? I think it's 31.5. We have a big resistance there on the, on the URA, or is this it for uranium? Yeah, it's a good question. I, I'll share, I will share a chart with that, uh, with you for on, for that one. Um, let me just uh, get that screen sharing back on. I've got the Cameco chart and the URA chart, um, which I follow quite closely for obvious reasons. Cameco is the the big guy in that um, in that sector, um, but I think maybe at the moment the URA chart is this is this is the uranium ETF URA. Um, and I use this chart just because the technical chart um, aspects of it are very pleasing. It broke out. It had a false breakdown back here in 2020, and then it broke out. At that point, I was very, very bullish on uranium, and I, you know, it's a matter of public record that I said that it was, in my view, likely to be the bottom of the bear market there. But of course, you don't get the evidence for that until you get above the three-year moving average, and you, know, you start getting above the Ichimoku cloud here, and that's where you need to be for. A, for a bull market. Happily, we're still above the three-year moving average and we're still above the Ichimoku cloud. So big picture, we're still in a bull market. But I've got some concerns here because if I zoom right in, you can see this volume node at uh, around about 29 on the URA mm. ETF. And we're currently sitting below that at uh, just a little bit above 28. And if you look at that red candle, it is breaking below the edge of that red inner arc there. Um, and Going back to what I said before, you have to be a little bit realistic about where you draw these lines because they're subjective. Um, the objective part is the three-year moving average, and we're above that. But I will have concerns if we close out this month below that volume node at twenty-nine dollars. So, you know, another ten days or so to give a more definitive view on that. But at the moment, there are concerns uh, below twenty-nine dollars. I'd be a little bit worried. Um, and it probably would mean that we're going to go and test the three-year moving average down near uh, $24. Um, certainly anything below, you see, you see we tested the three-year moving average back here in uh, 2023. So that, that's plausible. Um, and if, as long as we remain above the three-year moving average, big picture, if you got in down here like I did, you're, you know, in terms of the big picture, you're still okay. You're still in a, 
uh, a big picture defined bull market. But if you're trading this on shorter time frames, um, you know you'd have a problem. We're not actually in um, uranium. It's not. It's not, the, the space is not um, in a sustainable clear uptrend at the moment. So it's it's just not. It's too too flaky for trading. But for those who took long term positions much lower down, then the message is we are still in a bull market. We haven't broken down. So it's a it's a time frame thing, and you know my colleague Patrick will tell you the same thing. When somebody asks you, "Are you bullish or bearish?" the first thing you have to say is, "On what time frame? What time frame do you want me to answer the question on?" I'm 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 fairly bearish in the short term time frame. You know, if you're talking about days or weeks, but if you're talking about you know months, six months, twelve months, there's no reason to be bearish at the moment because the chart hasn't broken down on those longer time frame um, aspects. So, is I see it all over Twitter, and it, when someone you know really gets under my skin a little bit, oh, you're bullish, or oh, you're bearish. No, nah, what time frame? Please tell me what time frame. Are you a are you a, a day trader? You a swing trader? Are you a position trader? Are you an investor for the next ten years? Um, you, you have to understand that in this in this game, otherwise you're um, you're going to make some big mistakes. Yeah, well, I also asked my question. I also asked my guests to recommend a book or two that can help the audience become a better investor, become a better trader. Uh, so what are some books that you'd recommend, Kevin, that, the, that you think the audience would benefit from uh, digging into? Well, there's, there's one um, by a guy called Nate Silver called The Signal and the Noise, which um, I'm about halfway through reading. It's up on my shelf behind behind me at the Let's moment, see. along with uh, Stan Weinstein's Secrets for Profiting uh, in Bull and Bear Markets. So those two are my go-to uh, books. I mean, Nate Silver um, talks about how technical chart analysis has a lot in common with um, the betting industry and um, and sports games and betting in sports games and the algorithms and the techniques and the, the way you analyze um, past performance to put the odds in your favor. And then he goes on later in the book to talk about meteorology, which is pro probably one reason why I like it. And he talks about um, you know how uh, uh, weather forecasting models are probably the most advanced way of predicting the future that I can't think of anything actually on planet earth where future prediction is done more scientifically and more accurately. And a lot of people will be sitting in their chairs laughing at that saying, what are you talking about? They can't forecast what's going to happen three hours ahead. Well, actually, you know, when you look at it, uh, uh, sort of um, without any bias, the number of occasions that are um, where the forecast is broadly speaking, correct, far outweighs the number of occasions when it's broadly speaking, uh, incorrect. Uh, people just don't notice the correct forecast. They only notice the incorrect ones, which is why it gives that impression. But um, yeah, there's so much commonality between uh, model techniques for forecasting future weather a few days ahead, a few hours ahead, or you know, even when you're trying to predict a, you know, a month ahead or something. Those techniques are extremely similar, and you can use those techniques. And you, by the way, you don't actually need to change the odds very much. If you can just get your broad forecast correct on... 60 or 70 percent of occasions or even 50 percent of occasions or even less than 50 percent 40 percent by using sound risk and money management and limiting your losses and and uh, um and maximizing your gains or allowing your, your winners to run if you like then you can actually be a very profitable trader you don't actually need to get more than 50 percent of your forecasts uh, correct yeah worthwhile lesson i'll have the link to both of those books down below if you guys are interested in checking them out um Kevin, it's been a pleasure having you on. Any concluding thoughts before we wrap things up? <laughs> Just hold on tight for what's coming later on this year. I think it's a crazy world we're living in at the moment, but I suppose nothing changes in that regard. Um, it's just the wheel turning yet again. But uh, yeah, it's. I, it, I, I just hope and pray that you know we can get through this this coming few years without any uh, major global catastrophes you know man-made catastrophes it's um it's a worrying time but hey you've got to live your life and enjoy the enjoy the moment of you as much as you can 100 percent. well uh tell us about a uh, north star bat charge where can we find you and uh you know thanks for coming on yeah sure uh well you can find me on uh, x as it's called now of course at north star charts and uh, my colleague uh, patrick Krim is there as well uh, at bad charts one and the website <laughs> thanks to thanks to his uh, x handle is at north star badcharts.com that's uh, that's that's what explains the the name for our web website northstarbadcharts.com so uh, yeah if you like what i've been saying there then feel free to uh, 
pop by and uh, and, and have a look. Yeah, very uh, very meticulous, very uh, scientific, scientifically oriented analysis that I've seen from both of you guys over there at the website. So uh, I'll suggest people check it out. Link is down below. And uh, also, I'd like to remind you to hit that subscribe button if you enjoyed this content. Also, hit the like button. Comment down below. Go, Kevin, go. If you enjoyed what Kevin said, otherwise, let me know what you didn't like. Let me know what you disagreed with. Comment down below, and I will see you in the next episode. Bye, y'all.